Hey guys, it's Hannah, and today I'm going to review Atheists Who Kneel and Pray by Taryn Fisher. This is a book that has been on my radar for far too long, and you're gonna come for me even if I ask you not to. I was put off by the title, and as someone who doesn't identify with any religion or any practice, I wasn't super attracted to the book for the title alone. I was attracted to it still because I know that I love Taryn's writing. Um, it just took me a minute to, you know, bite the bullet and just do it. I was worried that the book would have too many religious undertones and that would be the point of the plot. Because I, okay, I thought that because I have a thing where I don't like to read summaries or synopses anymore from authors that I know that I love because I feel like I can predict it because I've read enough by them. And so I don't read the summaries, so I had no idea what it was about. But I loved it. I loved it so much. This book was one of my favorites of hers. Mudvayne always has my heart. I really, really enjoyed Marrow. This is probably up there though. Maybe third place? It's got the bronze, I think. The writing in this was phenomenal. I will say the passage of time made me leery in some places. Some places it was great. It was fantastic. It did what he needed to do. And other times I was like, wait, give me more. I need more. I don't know if this is necessarily the inspiration behind it, but in my head I had this picture painted. You know when you hear the stories about an artist, be it a singer, a painter, what have you, a writer, and then they have their muse and like the person who like breaks their heart, the person who inspires them to write or paint or hone their craft, like there's the muse, which I might briefly actually get into a little bit of etymology on muses. I've read it somewhere once, or maybe it was in a class I took, and I find it interesting, but I, I digress. But the story is always told from the perspective of the one who, I hate to say possesses the muse, but so that you can understand. I don't think people can be like, oh, like that. I just... And it's never told from the perspective of the muse. That's kind of what this story is. That's how I imagined it. So she travels in and out of people's lives, in and out of cities. She moves around everywhere. She's originally from London. She's going all across the United States. She never gives herself the chance to grow roots, nor does she really have the desire to do so. The synopsis that I have on Goodreads says she is a wandering muse. She dates men who need her, but always moves on to something new, never staying in one place for very long. David Lissy is in need of a muse. A talented musician lacking lyrical inspiration. When he first sees her, he knows he's found what he's looking for. Yara believes she can give David exactly what he needs to reach his full potential. A broken heart. David's love is religion. Yara's religion is heartache. Neither is willing to surrender, but religion always requires sacrifice. That's the first time I've read the synopsis. And it's it's pretty spot on. Um, so it follows these two characters. I wanted to say intermediate stages of a relationship, but you know, like the beginning as it develops, as it grows, as it matures, the problems that they have, the insecure. Okay, it really does hone in on um, insecurities, but not in a corny way, just in a very realistic way. I find that Taryn's characters always have this thickly rooted vein of realism. They never feel half-hearted. They never feel um, like a sketch. They feel detailed. And I found that to be true, especially in this case. There were lots of little one-off things that I, as someone who values art and music and writing, very... I, I hold it in high regard. I was a sucker for all this. There were these little one-offs, like musicians were in love with being doomed and... <laughs> There are really honest things in here too. That I think is an element to a lot of her books. They're very raw and very honest for the most part, some more than others. Um, this one I felt like was the most probably. So a quote, I was in the middle of an existential crisis and he was making me his person. How could he afford to be that honest? I was cheap. I fell for it because most of us really want to be wanted. Oh, and then there was the thing that gets me the most is like mother-daughter issues. And I'll get into that in the spoiler section. I think I've said about all I can say without spoiling plot for you. So if you haven't read it and you want to read it, please go do that. Come back when you've finished. Or if you don't mind being spoiled and you want to watch the review anyway, and then maybe see if you want to read it after the fact, I guess hang around and we'll see. Um, I will go ahead and put up in the corner a poll where you can vote on the next video you would like to see from me. And I will see you guys later for those of you who are leaving. So spoilers now. The relationship and lack thereof that she had with her mother was so important to her and how she developed as a character. And I think it was the most important part of the book. Without getting too deep into it, I will read one part in which I will just say that I relate to it so much. And that was valid, I suppose. 
because I technically don't have a mother either, and it doesn't matter. People live without things and they thrive. My mother gave me a gift. It works against me, not for me. She was always irritated that I was around. As a child, I tried to stay out of her way as much as possible because she didn't like me to ask her questions. When she was home, I watched her keenly, eager to please, always wanting to earn half a smile or any sort of acknowledgement. If she was reading and I'd drop something in the kitchen, her head would snap up and she'd glare at me. I'd feel like such a failure in that moment, like I'd failed her in the deepest way. She never hit me, and she rarely shouted. It was her quiet that was distressing. As an adult, I am racked with guilt when I feel I have inconvenienced someone. That's how it works against me. If I walk into a cafe and I take the seat by the window, I feel guilt for being selfish, for taking the best table in the house. We're getting deep. I thought I was a crazy person for feeling guilty over stupid stuff like that. But it, it was the way I was raised as well. This character resonated so much with me because I found so much of myself in her. She was very guarded in her relationship with David and she never really opened herself up entirely. She was always, what do they call it? Like an emotional shield that you put up in a response to trauma. And trauma can mean a lot of different things. I don't wanna say neglect because I don't want it to seem it lessens actual like criminal neglect of children but like to a degree yeah neglect as a child and that is a trauma and it's a way that you're conditioned to think and you you feel that way and you bring it into your adult life and you bring it into your relationships all your relationships especially your romantic ones i'm sure especially when it comes from having a parent who you know should unconditionally love you and you feel that you don't have that it makes you feel unworthy of unconditional love and i felt like that was the heart of this book felt like it was very integral to the plot and to the story and I feel like that's what made it for me. Ugh, there was this part, um, the woman at the bar, I, I can't remember where it was, I want to say it was in London, I'm trying to find it. They were talking about the, the note, the 49er note, and she asked him what it meant. The lady at the bar, he says, she told me to write something random on the paper and leave. What? I say shocked. Penny? He nods. She said that if you give a random object to a person who is searching for something, they would create their own meaning around it, and that meaning would reflect the deepest desire of their heart. It was a way for the person to find their way back to you, even if it took a lifetime. There was no way I could have said anything to make you realize it was me you were looking for your whole life. You had to realize that on your own. I just loved... I, uh, that was one of my favorite parts in the whole book. Just the having that, the searching, the not knowing... Ah, uh, uh, okay, the come back to me, come back, come. That, I'm not one for big romantic gestures, but that was, that was it. I thought that was so, ugh. And the whole tour to friends thing where he went to all the different places that he knew that she had been and he opened up, I can't remember what it was called, um, but the bar. It's been a few months since I read this. I'm really trying to do this on memory. I'm hoping doing okay. That was the ultimate gesture, the ultimate gesture beyond a gesture, I think. I loved, I always loved the writing. I especially loved it in this book. I thought a lot about that, actually. It's when you can't get someone out. They crawl inside you and they just live there for the rest of your life. That's why people create art, because love crawls inside them and they need a way to get it out. Um, don't be off put by the title if you ended up watching the whole thing thinking you wouldn't enjoy it read it. I try not to talk about every plot point for fear that others would have felt the same way as me and maybe not have given it um, a fair shake initially. But um, if you stuck with me and you haven't read it, I hope that you do. It's it's really, really good. It's one of my favorites of hers now. It's the sweetest of hers, even though it's not so sweet. But you know, compared to Mudbane. <laughs> I hope that you guys enjoyed this and please do remember to go ahead and vote on that poll so I know what videos you guys would like to see next and I will see you next time. Bye.